From Glean Education, this is Ed Leaders in Literacy, a podcast series that features educators and administrators who have made hard decisions about instruction, curriculum, intervention, school systems, and now remote learning to close the achievement gap and build equity in their school districts. Today, I'm really excited to chat with Dr. Michael Cormick, Chief of Staff of Jackson Public Schools in Jackson, Mississippi. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to have you here today. I discovered by way of research that we are alumni of the same university, Boston College, so it's always fun to see that. Exactly. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. Um, so in this podcast, uh, we mainly talk about literacy, but we're focusing our shift on something kind of slightly different that's going on in education right now, but does include an education um, and literacy conversation, which is remote learning. So I'd love to hear about your district and tell us kind of the state of the situation right now. Great. Well, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am the chief of staff for Jackson Public Schools, which is located in Mississippi and the Mississippi capital. Um, we serve um, scholars, about um, 23,000 scholars uh, in the capital city um, across um, 58 uh, different schools and programs. Um, and so um, we're one of the largest uh, districts in our state um, and the only urban uh, district in the state of Mississippi. Um, and we've um, all, like all everyone across the country, have had to really adapt our approach um, to providing instructions to our students um, during uh, this period of this unprecedented um, health pandemic and um, really trying to think uh, about our approaches to um, instruction um, as uh, parents are engaging in homeschooling and really giving them the practical resources they need to try to um, arrest some of the achievement gap that we know is, is kind of inevitable given this uh, the length of the time that we anticipate being out. Mm. Um, so how long have you been out of school? So um, we, um, like many um, Southern school districts, um, we take spring break uh, pretty early in March. Um, and so we were out um, this, the, the first, the second full week in March for spring break. Um, and it's really uh, during that midweek in March where um, the, there was a heightened level of awareness about coronavirus and um, districts uh, started to engage in conversations about closing schools. So we've been out since uh, March 6th. Um, and um, we then closed schools over the spring break and have elongated our spring break. So now we've been out for a period of um, three full weeks headed into uh, a month of being out of school. And did that time allow you to prepare in a way that school closure that happened on a Friday and reopened to remote learning on a Monday didn't enable those schools to do? No. So, I mean, um, of course, um, during the week of spring break, there was, as I said, a heightened awareness about the coronavirus and um, the growth of um, the, the numbers, the rate of infections um, uh, with coronavirus. And so um, many of our teachers and our central office uh, departments that support learning, our Office of Teaching and Learning, were starting to think about uh, an anticipated closure, uh, but we didn't formally make those decisions and determinations until uh, the Friday of the, of, of the week that we were due back. So um, we really needed to assemble our teams quickly to think about ways that we could begin resource sharing. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to tap into a number of our networks um, to uh, think about instructional packets and, 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 and other kinds of things. Um, it, it took us just a, a few days of really intensive work uh, to get um, an introduction out. Um, but we are also really tasked um, with this core challenge, I believe, of equity. Um, equity is one of our district's core values, and we define that as all meaning all. And so really the challenge was, um, how do we ensure um, a, uh, a basic level of education for all of our scholars, particularly given some of the technological challenges and gaps that existed well before um, our, our closure? Um, and um, obviously, we serve a number. Uh, we are a 100% uh, Title I district, and so 
Um, we ha already had many of the challenges that are associated with, uh, with poverty and teaching low income um, students. Um, and so our challenge really is um, some of our surrounding districts have been able to really quickly leverage one-to-one -one programs in terms of devices. Um, that's not our reality. And so we've really needed to build in some support structures um, and rethink the way that we approach remote learning um, so that we could um, really live into our core value of equity. So I one of the things- Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I'm it. excited to hear more because this, um, you know, you're hearing a lot about school districts that have the ability to do the one-to-one -one and it's, it's not even really going that smoothly for them. There's challenges and difficulties and obstacles, but the truth is the access and the equity is a major issue that large urban districts and small rural districts are, are dealing with all across the country. So I'd love to hear more about how you approached it. Yeah, so um, we really needed to build the data set to support um, our at-home um, uh, access to internet and other resources. Um, and so we have both a paper format survey and an electronic survey that's going out to parents to just assess uh, what is the state of at-home internet uh, usage. Of course, we all had our hunches, but we really wanted um, any decisions that we made to be grounded in data and um, that would drive an approach to thinking about what we could do um, in terms of the, the number of devices that we have access to. Um, and so that's really going to inform the practice around um, devices. Um, we also know that there's a whole, uh, that not all devices are created equal. So many of our parents uh, and families have smartphones, but trying to, to do a complex work and to engage in coursework uh, over a, an iPhone is very different than uh, an iPad device, a, a desktop computer. And so there's just a whole range uh, of, uh, of devices that uh, uh, folks are using and leveraging. And then also just the speed of internet. So is it high speed internet? Um, and so it's really caused us to think creatively. Um, myself, uh, our superintendent, Dr. Eric Green, um, served uh, on our mayor's, uh, the city of Jackson's task force really thinking about our coronavirus response. And we're partnering with the city to offer uh, broadband hotspots um, to low-income housing units. Um, and that can at least uh, help to mitigate some of the, the challenges with uh, speed. Um, we're also um, just leveraging our district website to make certain that we provide um, instructional packets to those scholars that have it. And then um, we've, um, done a, a, a feeding structure um, within 12 of our schools, which are geographically located around the city, but utilizing that as also a space to provide instructional packets and support um, to those that um, may have challenges with internet um, availability or printing at home. They can utilize one of our feeding centers, get an instructional packet, and then uh, leverage um, our teacher office hours um, where teachers are standing by on the phone to be able to help and provide support over the phone um, through conference call structures for parents that, that you know, do have uh, cell phone devices or a landline. So we just had to think across the board in terms of accessing instruction and um, really thinking about how do we ensure that they get to all of our, our scholars in the city. That's fantastic. And what did you find from those parent surveys? Were, were you surprised by anything that came back or it validated what you had thought? It validated many of our hunches. Um, of course, um, there uh, many um, have internet um, availability at home, but the, the, they would not classify it as high speed. Um, as I mentioned, there's a whole uh, you know, uh, range of devices. And so there are many that have a cell phone or a smart device that's internet capable but have multiple children and not multiple devices. And so um, just the presence of uh, a cell phone that it has internet capable doesn't really then provide uh, the access or the equity of access for um, you know, multiple child families. And so um, we're gonna be able to utilize this data to think about how we um, you know, address that, those, those gaps and challenges in a targeted way because um, we've actually uh, ask for parents to um, submit um, the survey for each child. And so we, we know students who have devices and those without. 
That's very smart. So it seems like you put systems in place to, to guarantee equity and access or to support it because it's hard to guarantee it in these times. Um, that's on the district level. And tell me a little bit more about the teacher approach. It, is it, were you, did you have time to prepare in a way that supported teachers kind of with the systems that they should be aware of for remote learning? And um, how is that going? Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, so our teachers are incredibly creative. Um, and before we were even able to set up the district supports, um, we're, we're innovative, we're checking in on students, we're making certain that counseling sessions could continue to occur over the phone for um, scholars with, uh, with you know, specialized uh, social emotional supports. Um, they were incredibly creative. Um, and uh, we saw a number of them uh, going live on Facebook <laughs> to provide instruction and just thinking about outside the box ways to continue um, the instruction. With the insertion of some district related instructional resources, one of the things that we wanted to do is just to say um, and encourage by grade level and band teachers to utilize those resources in a more consistent fashion um, and then to create a structure around a consistent set of expectations about uh, the office hours. Um, and so, of course, we, um, our, our teachers um, and staff members are continuing to be paid during the outage. So we're both closed, but we're um, also, um, they're still on the dole. And so we wanted to communicate that these are the expectations for that time. And they've been remarkably creative. Um, teachers are also leveraging this as a great opportunity for their own professional development and, and learning. And so we've had a number of our existing professional development partners um, that have said, um, we want to provide continuing educator credits. Um, we want to make certain that you are licensed to the fullest extent possible. So it's a great time for continuing educator units and credits to keep that certification um, tight. And then we've set up some structures. And so um, the approach both to uh, checking in on students and also um, growing them their their own uh, knowledge and skill set has been just really remarkable. Um, the uh, teachers group, there was a teacher group in South Jackson that even uh, that even organized a student parade uh, or a teacher parade uh, throughout uh, communities through South oh, Jackson. And so yeah. uh, it was just really exciting to see. Um, the ways that they were uh, communicating just the, the high level of care uh, for, for our scholars during this time away. Mm, that's great. Um, what challenges, if any, do you see with different grade levels? Are there any grade levels that you're seeing are harder to support remotely uh, versus others? Yeah, so that's a, a, a really interesting question. Um, of course, um, you know, all of our scholars are precious to us. We've had some acute challenges around our high school scholars that are nearing graduation. Um, our seniors, and in, 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 uh, in particular, uh, are a group that uh, we're concerned about. There's so many uh, important rituals uh, around your senior year, the prom, uh, graduation. Um, a lot of folks who've had real concerns about, you know, how will we um, uh, maintain and um, celebrate the work of those students um, at the uh, the end of their career in such a uh, just such a uh, a shift and a uh, unusual a potential challenge yeah. uh, to them as we think about just ways to structure um, those opportunities. Um, additionally, um, they were very pressed around um, wanting to know um, pathways to graduation. So traditionally in Mississippi, we have a number of um, high school um, exit exams um, that students take. Um, and so those subject area tests were of uh, top of mind concern for those that were nearing graduation that would have opportunities to assess uh, ordinarily. Um, but um, through um, this challenge and the cessation of testing for this year, um, we're really concerned about the mechanics of graduation and whatnot. And so we've spent a lot of time just thinking about um, smartly um, of course, we, we celebrate the fact that the, the priority is on health and wellness and not testing, yeah. um, but still there were some questions to be ironed out in the details um, connected with um, our senior graduation and, and many of the, 
the um, the rules connected with accountability and graduation. Um, so we try to pay special attention to that group of students. Um, additionally, on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, our, our, our youngest scholars, our pre-kindergarten students and kindergarten students, um, you know, we have to be really hands-on and, and just thinking about the developmentally appropriateness of instructional packets. It's not the uh, preferred delivery mechanism for younger scholars. And so um, we've also just really thought about how we leverage some of our existing assets that could help us expand equity. And one of those is um, our instructional television department. Um, we're fortunate to have a cable access unit and channel um, and we do that in partnership with the city. And so uh, for even some of our scholars that don't have high speed internet, many of them did have cable. Um, and so um, we've been able to use our instructional television unit and to uh, have teachers conducting read alouds, um, which we're able then to take from the cable channel into YouTube, into uh, Facebook sessions, um, and to provide those read aloud opportunities. We also um, leveraged uh, Accelerated Reader, which generally we restrict uh, students taking tests uh, only in building. And so we opened up that access so that now scholars through uh, Myon can uh, have access to digital books, the ability to test for those scholars that do have the, uh, a device, and then pair it with read alouds and instruction offered through our instructional television. Um, and so teachers have been really excited to share many lessons over that. We can edit those pretty quickly and then get them up and then provide a schedule by grade level with grade level appropriate uh, direct instruction through instructional television. That's amazing. That's exciting. And a great example of how you guys are thinking outside the box and making things work for your scholars and, and staff. I just want to also say that I love that you call your students scholars. I think that's amazing. I've been in education a long time and I've never heard that consistently used. It tells me a lot about your school district and how you view your students and where you see them heading. And it's just inspiring. I think it's amazing. Very much appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, language is powerful and, and it conveys meaning. And so we want to view them with a sense that they can um, tackle any challenge um, and that investment of when you see yourself as a scholar, you behave as a scholar. And so what does that mean? That you become a reader, a writer, a problem solver. The approach is just very different. So um, it's, a, it's a language change and a shift, but then it also informs the way that we both behave and take ownership for um, their education. I love it. I love it. Well, I want to say thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to chat with us today uh, so that we can learn more about what you're personally doing and what your school district is doing in Jackson, Mississippi. Thank you so much. Jessica, it's been a pleasure and just so excited. Just want to shout out uh, Team JPS. It really is a team and a family concept and want to uh, salute the, 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 the entirety of the team, both our teachers, principals, central office folks, um, our, our child nutrition team that's provided meals, uh, our nurses unit that's um, been such, such an integral part, uh, every member of the team, facilities and operations, um, just to name a few. And um, it's it a really is a team, team. concept. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, and, 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 you know, every, everyone has found a way to help and to support the work. And we've been just really uh, blessed uh, to, to have a talented team that really has put um, our scholars at the forefront and the supports that we can provide to those families. Excellent. Well, thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Michael Cormick and the great work they're doing at Jackson Public Schools to support their students during this time, you can visit their website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Bye for now. All right, bye-bye.